It's eighth grade, and a black man has just been killed by police officers in their hometown. Riots have broken out along street names that you recognize while you sit with your family for hours in the glow of buildings on fire, filling up your TV screen. In the morning, an emergency assembly is called at your school, and soon your day is filled with discussions about racial profiling, police brutality, and your role in the racial politics of America. As an Asian, I didn't know where I fell in those discussions. Despite being half white, I was constantly branded as a person of color by those telling me I needed to claim my identity and otherness. But as my black peer described the instantaneous nausea and terror he felt as he was pulled over for speeding, my own examples felt inadequate and out of place. That's not and never will be my experience. Yet, often when referring to racial discrimination, someone would say the issues people of color face, as if a dark-skinned girl with tightly curled hair would experience the same forms of racism as a porcelain-skinned girl with pin straight hair. As if the whole issue of racial discrimination didn't stem from a difference in skin tone. I had little to contribute to those discussions in the ways of personal experience, but as the day progressed, I was constantly reminded that I was, in fact, not just white. Which begs the question, what does it mean to be Asian? That day, it meant getting sandwiched somewhere between white guilt and true empathy. Part of the discussion, but not exactly. As a person of color, I felt some communal responsibility to further the conversation, contribute my own experiences. Yet, I lacked any sort of personal connection beyond striving for empathy. It was similar to the feeling of getting benched during a playoff game. I was not there as part of the group getting pummeled while fighting back, nor was I part of the group trying to tear them down. I never felt attacked, yet I knew if I didn't do anything, I would be contributing to the problem. All I could do was sit there and try to support them, affirm my peers' experiences, and rail with them against a broken criminal justice system that I would likely never fall victim to. Beyond that day, it meant growing increasingly bitter whenever the subject of race came up, as it was branded as a conversation about exploring one's own identity, but time after time turned black and white. Any concerns or problems I had related to my race were drowned out by the more important conversation about combating systemic racism against black people. And it was, it is an important conversation. It's rooted in the foundation of this country. It's life and death. But being thrown into this group and then sitting there in all your person of color glory as people lament that the black girl was the only person of color in your physics class feels like a cheap way to garner some sort of solidarity of minorities. It felt like being told, you're a person of color, you're a part of this community who empathizes with one another and are connected through racial identity and oppression, but we won't ever really recognize your identity, only how it relates to someone else's. Even so, any feelings of invisibility or of being used just brought about a tidal wave of shame at my own selfishness that I could possibly turn such horrific experiences into something about myself. And I was just left with the guilt, the fear that maybe my feelings were unwarranted, and maybe I was just racist, and the increasing desire to just ignore my own race entirely. Funnily enough, that wasn't hard for me to do. I'd never been that in touch with my Asian identity, personally or in society. For most of my life, I couldn't speak my mother language, and the only Korean friends I had were my cousins who were equally detached. What meager bits of Korean culture I held on to felt insignificant, an unusual middle name and needing soup I couldn't pronounce on New Year's. And until the coronavirus pandemic, I couldn't have given compelling examples of racism against Asians. Even now, I've been blessed with little to no experience myself beyond the gross ethnic lunch comments as a child that I brushed off and the fear that any academic achievement I ever produce will be seen as typical for an Asian. Growing up in a white progressive suburb and having a white father whose genetics made me ethnically ambiguous meant that I just blended in until the discussion of racial identity came up. Which I suppose is a positive, it's the colorblind principle at work. All people are human, race doesn't change that, so we should just ignore everyone's race. It's perfect assimilation. But then, what makes me Asian? Why is it that when I went to college thinking I wouldn't care who my friends were, I had this giddy feeling as I sat surrounded by my female East Asian friends in a whispers booth. Why is it that every time I see someone with dark straight hair and single eyelids on campus, a part of me yearns to be their friend? Why is it that I feel settled in LNYF? 
Why do I have any right to? The only Asian thing about me is my blood, and for some reason that doesn't feel like enough. It doesn't feel like a sufficient reason to claim a continent as part of my identity, or for my white friend to suggest that I can put a chopstick in my hair and it won't be racist. While race, ethnicity, and culture are all distinct concepts, it's hard to see my friends speaking to their parents in their native tongue and not feel inferior. That there's something missing in me tied to this ethnic group with a rich history and culture that I know next to nothing about. I have this overwhelming need to proclaim myself not as just a person of color, but as an Asian, specifically a Korean. But at the same time, I feel unworthy of that moniker, and I've spent most of my life trying to earn it. My identity became a dichotomy between attempting to strengthen my Asian ties and ignoring them completely. As a kid, I wore yin yang jewelry, as if doing so would endow me with a greater sense of Asian-ness. Later on, I taught myself to use chopsticks that I wouldn't have to ask for a fork in Asian restaurants. And I made myself listen to K-pop and eat Korean food regularly. Yet, it felt artificial, and more often than not, I defaulted to my white half and the white I saw around me. So, when it came time to go to college, I became determined to Asianize myself. I gave up five credits a semester, what would amount to a full major's worth of credit, of the little room in my schedule bogged down by a double major to learn Korean. I joined LNYF, I carefully set my four-year plan so that I could spend a semester in Seoul despite not minoring in Korean. So, after all of that, do I feel more Asian? No. What I feel is a stronger sense of self, a greater security in who I am and who I want to be, but I'm no more Asian now than I was when I thought Kalbi was pronounced Karbi. The only Asian thing about me is my blood, and that's enough. If there's one thing the colorblind mentality gets right, it's that blood is the only thing truly different between us at birth. I don't have to prove my identity to anyone. There is nothing to prove beyond a DNA test, I suppose. I am Asian and my experience is no less valid because it differs from a native's or an immigrant's. Perhaps I'll feel more Asian if I live there one day, but my ethnicity won't change if I never do. And maybe my role in police brutality will most likely not be as the victim or aggressor, but that does not mean I'm just a spectator, or that my actions won't support upholding or dismantling racist institutions. Nor does it mean that the real racism Asians have faced in America is inconsequential because, until recently, it may not have always come in the visceral form of violence. So, why do I feel settled in LNYF? Because the people around me exemplify what I'm working towards, and what I see in myself that has been neglected for so long, at the risk of sounding like a promo. They are confident in themselves and their identities. They don't have to scream, I am Asian. They just live their lives as Asians. And as much as being around these people has reminded me how little I do know, what meager bits of Korean culture in my life I do have now seem precious rather than lacking. Maybe one day I'll be able to properly articulate what being Asian means to me, but for now, I'm just satisfied with finally feeling confident that I am.